Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming uh, to this uh, session. Uh, as I was anticipating, uh, uh, this uh, session will be in English because we have uh, uh, some uh, English speaking uh, uh, persons that will uh, uh, present a contribution to the session. Um, so, my name is Monica Scannapieco. I work in ISTAT uh, in the Methodological Directorate. The topic of this session is uh, from big data to smart statistics. And it promises to be a very interesting session. We will have uh, five different speeches. We will uh, start from two contributions from ISTAT on the latest result that we have achieved in ISTAT on uh, the big data topic. Uh, and specifically on the use of Twitter data and uh, on the use of uh, internet as a data source. The third speech uh, will, be, uh, from, uh, will be given by Peter Strass from uh, Statistics Netherlands. Uh, he will give us an overview of uh, European level results uh, in the field of uh, uh, big data. And uh, uh, I, I'm sure uh, you will see a, a lot of uh, things that uh, are happening uh, at the European level. So uh, it promises to be very interesting too. Then uh, there will be uh, the presentation by Eurostat, uh, Albert Wirtman. Uh, the topic is uh, trusted uh, smart statistics as uh, the uh, next uh, frontier of uh, big data. And uh, finally, uh, we, will, uh, uh, we are very pleased to have the perspective of uh, a big data provider, uh, Wintre, uh, that will describe uh, uh, mobile phone data analytics, uh, the story from their perspective. Uh, so as you see, uh, we have a very uh, significant, relevant, and interesting contribution. So uh, I would uh, uh, like to start right now so that we can uh, have a full experience during this session of all uh, the results, the technical results that uh, have been achieved so far, and uh, as well as the future perspective in this field. Uh, okay, so uh, I would start with the presentation by Diego Zardetto. Uh, Diego uh, is, uh, uh, so please uh, you can change the slides so that uh, uh, we can give the floor to Diego Zardetto. Uh, Diego works uh, in the methodological directorate of ISTAT. Uh, he is in ISTAT uh, since uh, uh, 2002. And uh, uh, given that uh, he also work, uh, works with me, I know that he is a, uh, a very good data scientist. So. Uh, I'm sure you will be very much interested uh, in his presentation uh, and uh, in his results uh, on Twitter data. Uh, so let's have uh, the Diego Zardetto slides, please. So meanwhile, uh, Diego, you have uh, 20 minutes uh, starting from the moment in which we will have the slides. Okay. I think I will go to help for the slides. on this so <clears throat> good morning to everybody this talk is about 
using Twitter data for the social mood on economy index. Uh, let me start with some motivation and goals. Uh, nowadays, more and more people all over the world use social media platforms to uh, keep up with the news, uh, to express their feelings and state of mind, and to share and debate opinions about virtually every possible topic. This fully justifies the interest of official statistics towards social media sentiment analysis applications. And for this reason, we have been recently investigating, and still we are, whether social media messages uh, can be used to develop domain-specific sentiment indices. What does it mean? It means that we didn't want to end up with a generic mood of the nation index, but rather we want to be able to measure the Italian mood about specific topics or aspects of life which are relevant in official statistics, like, for instance, the economic situation, the European Union, the migrants phenomenon, and so on. If we succeed, we could enable ESTAT to deliver high frequency and perhaps daily measures of the Italian mood on interesting phenomena. And of course, the ultimate hope and goal is that such high frequency indices could either improve ESTAT's forecasting models or enrich existing statistical products like the sustainable well-being indicator, or even be disseminated as new statistical outputs in their own right. Now, we want to be relevant, but to be relevant, we have to face and somehow mitigate a well-known issue of uh, social media sources, that is the pointless babble, which means that the vast majority of social media messages are entirely irrelevant in an official statistics perspective. For this reason, we developed the procedures to collect uh, only social media messages that match at least one keyword uh, from a filter. For filter, we mean a collection of uh, relevant Italian words uh, that have been set up by subject matter experts uh, and ideally should be able to capture only relevant messages and uh, eliminate since the beginning off-topic messages. At the moment, we are just using Twitter as a source, but further social media platforms platforms can be introduced later on. We have been gathering uh, uh, tweets since February 2016 by means of two filters. The first one is called the social mood on economy filter. It has been designed to uh, measure the Italian mood about the economy and collects more or less 40,000 tweets per day. So up to now, we have uh, 38 million tweets from this filter. The second filter is much broader in scope. It is called the ESTAT filter, has been designed mainly for diagnostic and validation purposes, uh, and collects more or less 170,000 tweets per day. So for this second filter, we have up to now 150 million tweets. Now, let me go very quickly to the filters. Uh, uh, the social mood on economy filter is made up of 60 keywords that have been mainly borrowed uh, by the questioner items of the Italian Consumer Confidence Survey. This is a monthly survey that collects data in the first two weeks of each month and releases its output by the end of the month. Uh, I have to stress here that the phenomenon tracked by the social mood on economy index is much broader and only partially overlaps consumer confidence. However, it can be very useful because it, our index can detect and promptly point out events uh, that uh, may happen to be missed by the official survey just because they happen in the second half of the month, just after the interview period. And the most striking example is the Central Italy earthquake in 2016, which happened on the 24th of August. Uh, the ESTAT filter is much larger. I said uh, that uh, uh, it gathers a lot of more tweets. Uh, it, its uh, keywords have been derived by the teams that are used to browse ESTAT's online data warehouse, ESTAT. So it has been devised to represent, uh, uh, let me say, a small scale model of all the possible tweets that should ever be of some interest to official statistics. Uh, we are using uh, periodically this uh, second filter to validate the first one 
And based on this, we can empirically say that the social mood on economy index, the smaller one, is doing a pretty good job. So this is our processing pipeline uh, at a glance. You see the main building blocks. Of course, we uh, collect uh, samples of tweets. We filter them uh, through the social mood on economy filter. We score uh, the tweet. Uh, and then we cluster the tweet of each day into positive, negative, and neutral tweets. Uh, Based on this clustering, we compute a daily sentiment index. And I must stress that we put in place a surveillance system because we can never be sure 100% that the filter entirely eliminates off-topic tweets. But we didn't want that these off-topic tweets can contaminate and bias our time series. So there is uh, an ongoing outlier detection uh, uh, routine that periodically uh, scans the whole daily time series of the of the index. So let me go to data collection and storage. Uh, as I anticipated, we are using Twitter streaming API to access uh, to Twitter data, and we are collecting in near real time samples of public tweets. I underline public. This means that these are tweets that are immediately visible to everybody, even to those who are not uh, Twitter users, so there are no privacy concerns in the collection phase. Uh, our target population is a population of tweets, uh, the whole uh, ensemble of tweets that match at least one keyword of the, of the filter. This is at odds with the traditional surveys, where target population are individuals or enterprises. And uh, again, at odds with the survey uh, of traditional kind, we don't, we don't control the sampling design of this experiment. The sampling algorithm is entirely controlled by Twitter, and we can at most uh, uh, sample one percent of the tweets uh, that are tweeted uh, in a given time. So Twitter API returns data in JSON format. We temporarily store this JSON data on a staging area residing on an internal server, and uh, periodically Periodically, we load bunches of this tweet on an Oracle DB to enable their processing. Our process uh, is daily, we, which means that uh, we compute the daily index, uh, elaborating the whole tweets uh, collected in a day as a, single, as a single block. The only information we are now using from the tweets is the textual content of the tweet. This means that our index uh, is based only on unlinked anonymized data because we never use information about the authors of the tweet. We don't know who they are. So again, a privacy preservation guarantee. Then we clean and normalize the text of the tweets, uh, applying standard natural language uh, preprocessing steps, uh, and we perform sentiment analysis. Uh, our approach is entirely unsupervised and based on a lexicon. This is at odds uh, and opposed uh, to other approaches based on machine learning, which are typically supervised. But we couldn't apply this second, perhaps better approach, because we were unable to find a large scale, high quality training set of human level tweets in Italian. Italian is somewhat underrepresented in this kind of experiments. So our sentiment analysis involves two phases. First, we calculate sentiment scores for each tweet, and then we cluster based on this tweet or on these scores, the tweets of the day into positive, neutral, and negative classes. To attach sentiment scores to each tweet, we use an Italian sentiment lexicon that is a vocabulary where Italian words are associated to pre-computed positive and negative sentiment scores. We are using this Sentix lexicon, which aligns and integrates several existing resources. So it, it encompasses several, uh, let me say, duplicated lemmas, and we had to deduplicate it to uh, guarantee reproducible and unambiguous uh, results at the end. So how these uh, scores are attached to the words uh, by the lexicon? The lexicon comes with positive and negative scores. These are constrained into the interval 0, 1, and their sum must be at most 1. This means that each word in the lexicon is mapped to a point uh, into this uh, sentiment triangle. And uh, this triangle has uh, on the x uh, axis uh, the positive score, and on the y axis the negative score. So 
points that are closer to the horizontal line are much positive than uh, much more positive than points that are close to the vertical lines and there's also a neutral area in between now besides uh, cartesian coordinates we can use uh, uh, polar coordinates to compute two others very interesting scores of sentiment the polarity which is a linear transformation of the angle and runs from minus one for bad mood to one which is the best possible mood and intensity intensity is the length of this vector which simply gives you the idea that two words can be both positive in polarity but one may, com may convey this polarity in a much stronger way than the other think for instance good and best both are positive but, but best is uh, a lot stronger so each word is mapped to a four-dimensional sentiment space actually with these two additional uh, scores and to enable clustering we have to pass from the level of the scores of the words to scores attached to two tweets tweets are text though very short ones and how do we do that this way can be easily grasped uh, visually this way by an example we just compute the center of mass of the distribution of the matched words on the sentiment triangle and represent with the uh, this center of mass the tweet and then we compute uh, the cartesian and polar coordinates of this center of mass so we have a, a uh, sorry, a real world uh, tweet uh, which says the Jobs Act, Reforma Americana, Proposta da Renzi, un fallimento, dati Istat, la disoccupazione giovanile in aumento. This is a pretty in scope tweet uh, and we start comparing it with a lexicon. The first match we find is uh, for Reforma. This is uh, evidently a good polarity word, so its image goes there and so we find also fallimento which is a bad polarity word uh, and goes up there and then we find dati in uh, its uh, stemmed form uh, dat uh, which is slightly only slightly negative uh, and uh, again we find disoccupazione definitely a bad uh, or uh, negative mood uh, word uh, and lastly uh, giovanil which is a positive and goes exactly over reforma so this explains why we have doubled the size of this point because it weights more here and the last word we find is aument which is a, a positive mood uh, word so we have now six match words three are positive three are negative uh, the tweet for us will be represented by the center of mass of this, this distribution which goes here where you should the small uh, tweeting bird uh, we compute the cartesian coordinates uh, and we have the positive and negative polarity of the tweet uh, and only here at this moment we compute the vector and we pass to polar coordinates and compute polarity and intensity so the polarity of this tweet is negative uh, overall and the, its strength is not so much uh, important the intensity is quite low which is uh, reasonable because it has uh, three positive and three negative words so uh, once we have all our tweets scored this way for a whole day we can map them to the four-dimensional space here you have a two-dimensional projection with a two-dimensional density plot the darker spots are the places of the sentiment triangle where the tweets are uh, more abundant uh, there are more tweets and now we can cluster this distribution we use k-means and to decrease the uh, risk of finding a local optimum we run k-means 100 of times uh, with random starts uh, just pick the best solution the result should look like this with the, in this case more negative tweets than positive uh, as you can see and lastly we compute the uh, daily value of the index which is just uh, the average polarity of the tweets of the day weighted by the tweets intensity this formula is uh, uh, original and it is more resilient to tweets misclassification than other alternatives which are used uh, in literature and reduces day-to-day -day volatility of the index uh, typically the the measure that are used only uh, rely on the amount of the count or proportion of positive and negative tweets we are using also the intensity and the polarities so 
Uh, since uh, no filter is perfect, uh, we uh, devoted special care to avoid possible contamination of our index by off-topic tweets that might pass the filter. For this reason, we put in place a surveillance system which routinely uh, scans the time series by two independent and complementary outlier detection routines. Whenever anomalous or potentially anomalous uh, values are detected, uh, the system generates diagnostic rewards automatically, which are later sent to human uh, reviewers, uh, which are in charge of deciding whether these are actually proper data points or instead truly anomalous values. The latter case typically arises when uh, one of topic tweet uh, m passes the filter and by chance uh, becomes viral on Twitter. These viral tweets uh, uh, be may be tweeted uh, and quoted thousands and thousands of times in the whole day and so they can have a, an unduly impact and bias the series. So we, at the end, uh, impute them by nearest neighbor interpolation. So just a quick look to the volume we are collecting uh, during the, the data collection period. There's a burst after the 2018 elections. This is relevant because the debate after the elections has been driven mainly by economic arguments like the, uh, the debt of Italy, the a possible euro uh, uh, exit of Italy from the euro area and so on. So we have this spike 95,000 uh, tweets. Then in the day where a leaked uh, sentence from the government contract uh, appeared, uh, uh, which stated that Italy will ask uh, to the ACB a, a debt write-off of, tw of 250 billion euros. We uh, jumped to 110,000 tweets. And lastly, uh, in the day of the spread peak, uh, uh, beside, uh, um, uh, well above 300 basis points, uh, uh, we have 230,000 tweets, which means that the filter is uh, doing a pretty good job because it increased the volume of tweets where topics are economics. Uh, this is also the day where the Commissioner Ettinger said uh, uh, the markets with, will teach Italians to vote right, as you may recall. Uh, this is the daily time series. It is very volatile, and you see in uh, uh, blue and red uh, 15 days and 13 days moving averages. Uh, this series uh, is definitely not a white noise. There are meaningful peaks and valleys that can be linked to clear underlying phenomena, and we annotated them. And uh, uh, you can see the valleys uh, are mainly related to disasters, uh, both human-made uh, disasters and uh, 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 natural disasters like the Central Italy earthquake, the Livorno flood, and also the Andrea Corrado train collision, someone may recall. Then there are also terrorist attacks. For instance, we have the truck attack in Nice and the Christmas market attack in Berlin. Then there is, uh, fortunately, another set of valleys which are strictly related to worries and debates about welfare and economy. For instance, we have uh, here some uh, uh, debates about poverty. Poverty, absolute poverty topping uh, four million and a half people in Italy. And then uh, worries about the pension systems, and mainly women's pension system. And then uh, worries about unemployment, and mainly youth unemployment. Uh, and lastly, also some complain about uh, the, youth of, uh, the, the income of youths, uh, which is perceived as uh, smaller than it was for their parents. There are, uh, fortunately, also some uh, peaks. Uh, the peaks related to welfare are related to, to school teachers' mobility. As you may recall, the Buona Scuola law uh, forced the uh, new uh, school teacher to not move uh, closer to their home for three years. But this uh, regulation was, uh, uh, let me say, uh, um, eliminated uh, by the budget law. So there is relief uh, of a school teacher. Then there are also pension system uh, good news, uh, and also a very interesting uh, uh, sentence by Pope Francis, who said that the most important goal is not income for everybody, but employment for everybody. 
And let me say also that there are peaks of related to finance and politics, and also, of course, uh, peaks related to holidays, uh, which are unavo unavoidable. Uh, I will very quickly conclude uh, with this very interesting signal we captured. This is the only time in which uh, the same topic sharply goes uh, from very optimistic to very pessimistic mood. Uh, and this is exactly the same topic that is the renewal of uh, women's option uh, Mm, retirement regulation for women. So this is a more favorable regulation for women in a given age class. And uh, as we see, we have a sharp decrease uh, during the summer, as if there were bad talks going on with the labor ministry. And indeed, you can see that the women's option has been actually rejected in 2018 budget law, which happened in December, several months uh, uh, after. So we have a signal that seems to anticipate what actually was going on because the renewal of this retirement opportunity was rejected, explaining the bad mood uh, drop. So just conclude with a comparison of the uh, monthly consumer confidence in the lower panel uh, uh, index and the monthly aggregates of our index on the top panel. As you can see, they don't look very much like uh, at first sight, but if you concentrate on two different time frames from March to March, 2016 to 2017, you see there's a common pattern here, a decrease up to August for us, up to September for the official consumer confidence survey. This is because we have the, ter the, the earthquake here that uh, the official survey doesn't see, and then a rebound. And also here, we have uh, more or less the same pattern. I mean, don't look at the levels, the, the, the scales are different, but look at the change. The only thing that, uh, in a sense, ruins this uh, well, um, this encouraging picture is uh, this bad period here, where the two indices are entirely anti-correlated. As you see, we, which with our index, we grow when the official consumer confidence uh, uh, decreases and vice versa. We have no clear understanding of why this happens, but we think it is very interesting. Uh, I conclude, uh, we are uh, right now finalizing a Doro uh, detailed time series analysis of the daily uh, social mood on economy index series. and. Uh, this, this new index has been accepted for publication as experimental statistics uh, on our website, so it will very soon be disseminated uh, through the website. Uh, so I ask you, please, uh, stay tuned, uh, and if possible, let us know your opinion. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Diego, for this rich presentation that, uh, let me underline, uh, also let us uh, uh, see how official statistics can work with the Twitter data like many other uh, people do, but uh, with the, uh, our methods and with the specific, the specific uh, care and attention to quality aspects that we are used to have. Uh, time for uh, uh, one question not more than this, and then at the end of the, of the session uh, we, w we can uh, collect more questions. So, one question for this talk. If no question, we can delay the question to the end of the session, and uh, I can ask uh, Alessandra Nurra to uh, start her presentation. Uh, so please, uh, two things. Uh, start the presentation uh, from the back, uh, please. Start the presentation of Alessandra Nurra, and uh, if you can activate her microphone, it would be great, so that uh, she has not to move from, uh, okay. So thanks, 
And uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Alessandra Nurra. Alessandra is an ISTAT researcher from uh, uh, the Directorate of uh, Economic Statistics. She is in charge of uh, uh, the ICT usage uh, and e-commerce survey. And uh, she will talk about uh, uh, the use of uh, internet as a data source uh, for uh, some uh, functionalities related to her specific survey. So the floor is yours. Uh, please, Alessandra. Um, thank you, Monica. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll try to give you some information about the first uh, ISTAT release uh, on uh, experiment of experimental statistics uh, um, coming from the usage of internet data and in particular of a website, uh, three website functionalities uh, collected uh, uh, for many years uh, uh, by uh, ICT survey. Um, the ICT survey is uh, one of the main, uh, sorry, sorry, one of the main uh, uh, source uh, uh, in uh, one of the main source of the European Community uh, statistics uh, on information and society and uh, giving information about uh, internet usage, uh, um, uh, digitalization of uh, uh, production process, e-commerce, uh, ICT uh, skills, and so on. And this indicator has used. Uh, by policymaker uh, to uh, to uh, measure the progress of uh, um, uh, um, of European and member states digital economy, for uh, um, year 2017, uh, population of interest, target population of the survey, uh, was about uh, 180 uh, enterprises with uh, ten, with at least 10 persons employed, uh, with a sampling frame of 32 thousands of enterprise and a uh, response rate uh, of 66 uh, percent. Uh, here are the three target variables uh, involved in this experimentation. And uh, these variables are uh, the, uh, um, uh, the rate of enterprises, enterprises where website provides uh, online ordering. Um, 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 the rate of enterprises where the website provided advertisement of open job position and uh, uh, where website uh, has links uh, uh, to enterprises' social media profiles. Uh, here there are some official statistics, uh, uh, statistics uh, about these three variables since uh, 2012, and we can see that, that the phenomena are slowly growing and Italy is uh, uh, below European values. Uh, also for uh, the filter question used in the uh, questionnaire about enterprises with the website that uh, uh, in Italy uh, uh, is 72% uh, in 2017. Mm, um, I would like to, to uh, highlight, highlight um, the importance of one of these uh, variables, that is web ordering. Web ordering is uh, one part of, uh, of uh, um, uh, web sales that is a significant uh, uh, variable in, uh, in ICT survey, uh, linked to uh, electronic sales and uh, more general uh, with uh, e-commerce uh, uh, variables. Uh, I think that internet data can, uh, on web ordering, can, you, can uh, uh, help uh, the production uh, unit to have more control of the evolution of, the, uh, of these uh, uh, variables that are um, competitiveness drivers, uh, permitting uh, enterprises, also small enterprises, to uh, to enlarge their market and uh, to access uh, uh, to uh, new uh, opportunity, uh, to, uh, to new trade opportunity. And uh, this is particularly important for Italy because, as you can see, Italy is uh, uh, um, uh, the percentage of ent uh, only 10% of uh, uh, enterprises in Italy declaring uh, uh, web sales. Uh, the main goal of this experimentation is, of course, the first one is uh, to replicate a subset of the estimates, uh, estimates uh, currently produced uh, by the survey. And to do this, we, um, we needed to investigate uh, new IT solutions, improving our skills, and uh, evaluating and comparing quality of alternative estimates. Uh, 
uh, with the traditional ones. Uh, the other uh, goal was to produce additional information. Uh, why? Because we uh, intend to increase the offer of statistical information. And uh, the last uh, was uh, to integrate the information collected by survey with the internet data to improve accuracy of traditional estimates. Um, in the blue arrows, you can see uh, the, mm, it's, it's a design, the traditional way to, uh, to, uh, to, product, to, pro, uh, to product estimates uh, by ICT survey, but uh, to use e internet, uh, ISTAT uh, developed a complex uh, procedure um, consists of five phases. The first phase was about uh, um, uh, getting uh, the list of uh, URL and uh, um, potentially for all uh, um, enterprises with uh, 10 persons employed with websites, so about uh, 130,000 uh, enterprises. Um, um, in this case, we uh, use uh, um, to, um, to uh, integrate and validate uh, a list of uh, available uh, um, web address, and also uh, we made a step uh, about uh, consisting of uh, um, web address retrieval using the nomination of uh, enterprise and, and also other information to, um, to um, um, to um, associate uh, the, uh, the web address to the, uh, each uh, enterprise. The second uh, phase was the web scraping phase. And, uh, um, and in this case, we, uh, we'd, uh, um, we had only, uh, only 100,000 websites to scrape. Um, reading uh, all on page, uh, on page and all other uh, pages uh, scrapable uh, up to 20 pages. And the next uh, phase was uh, text processing, so uh, mm, to transform uh, content of website into uh, data record with, uh, um, in, with, uh, with relevant information uh, related to three target uh, variables. Uh, and, and the, uh, the fourth phase was about uh, model fitting. In this phase, we use a machine learning procedure um, to, to, um, to uh, define the, uh, into a subset of enterprises uh, where both uh, uh, internet data, uh, data and survey data were available. Uh, to find the um, algorithm, right algorithm, uh, the best algorithm uh, used to, uh, to predict the value of the target variable um, and, uh, on the basis of the um, performance measures that we used uh, in uh, machine learning techniques uh, like uh, accuracy, precision, uh, sensitivity, and F1 score. And we use this, uh, 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 this um, uh, algorithm uh, on the total uh, of the uh, document, ter document terms matrix of the counting 85,000 enterprises. Uh, um, the, the number is reduced because, uh, because uh, the scrapable, uh, the scrapable uh, website was uh, uh, less than 100,000. So the last phase phase was about estimation. Uh, we uh, used the two, uh, two sorry, this, I have to skip this. Two, uh, we used two um, alternative estimates using uh, two estimators, uh, one uh, uh, based only on, uh, um, on, uh, on uh, predicted value, the full model based estimator, and the other one uh, was a combined estimator combining uh, uh, observed and predicted uh, values. And uh, then we um, make a, a, a comparison uh, among three different sets of estimates, uh, so with survey esti estimates and uh, alternative estimates. And we uh, have uh, here the first results. 
And uh, uh, as you can see, we have three different sets uh, of uh, estimates that, uh, that are not incoherent. Uh, in many cases, but uh, mm, even if not for all cases, uh, the uh, value of alternative estimates are inside the confident, uh, confidence interval of the survey estimate. Uh, in the vertical bars, you can see the, the current survey estimates. And in the square and triangle, uh, the uh, alternative estimates that are inside the dotted line um, um, that represent the confidence uh, interval of survey estimates. And, and this uh, occurs uh, for, uh, for uh, all domain of uh, the survey. In this case, we have uh, the, web, the size classes of persons employed at the domain, but also in, uh, in uh, domain considering 24 uh, economic activities, uh, um, um, we have the same uh, results. So we can say that, uh, mm, sorry. We can skip this. Uh, we we, we uh, achieve also the second uh, goals to, uh, that was to produce additional information. In fact, we, uh, we uh, using a model-based est estimator, we produce uh, an estimation of three target variables uh, on uh, 62 uh, economic activities, uh, uh, the division of NAIS uh, classification of economic activities, and we, um, we can see that we had uh, um, results that are in line with uh, our expectation. For example, for web ordering, we have that uh, the best performing uh, economic activities is in accommodation and uh, publishing uh, or travel agency and the worst in uh, uh, all manufacturing of tobacco but, uh, but um, in the uh, activity uh, related to construction, um, construction activity. All uh, data metadata uh, were published in a special section of the, of the website, of ISTAD website, and you can find there uh, also, uh, all, all uh, article and paper that we published uh, uh, can give you also more information about uh, the entire complex procedure. Um, these are uh, the uh, additional information for job advertisement uh, and this for uh, link to social media. Um, and again, you can find the best performing in accommodation on uh, programming, broadcasting, uh, and so on. Um, now some conclusion, some, uh, some uh, perspective for, from a uh, production point of view. Um, the first conclusion is, uh, of course, that full model-based and combined one estimates can be considered acceptable, but we need the time series analysis to verify stability to, of procedure and of the results. Uh, one important point is that the role of ICT service is very important because uh, uh, the data observed have an impact uh, not only on, uh, on uh, the, the, the phase of uh, fitting uh, the model, but also on, uh, directly on the combined uh, estimator. So the good quality of uh, answer of the, uh, of the, um, of the um, uh, respondent is uh, really very important, also because we uh, find, we discovered that in cases where uh, predicted values uh, was different uh, uh, from those reported by respondent, we, we discovered that in, in about half of the cases, uh, probably the difference was uh, due to response error, these after manual controls of, of uh, website uh, functionalities. Uh, so this open a question that is, uh, uh, this one for my opinion, is a respondent error? So all is uh, an error in, uh, for example, website scraped by the procedure. Uh, and so we have an uh, urgent need, uh, and also unfortunately uh, time consuming uh, need, uh, that is recontact respondent to try to do this uh, during the survey or after the, the, uh, the survey. And, oh, oh, and another solution could be also to ask uh, about web address uh, to respond inside the question of web functionalities and not at the end of the questionnaire, like is uh, now. 
uh, another, um, another um, solution could be also to improve our definition uh, included, in the, included in the questionnaire. Um, another opening question, of course, for the future is uh, about a, a European comparability. And the fact that we, uh, with the predicted values, we missing, are missing the possibility to use observed and predicted values uh, at the microdata level. We can uh, find, we can uh, um, do this, this type of analysis uh, anymore. Um, the work done could be extended and adapted in multiple ways. Uh, the first one is considering the three target variables, for example, evaluation, evaluating the possibility to, uh, to have information on other web functionalities, uh, like web payment, web delivery tracking. In case of job advertisement, we can also for example, find uh, details on characteristics of a single job uh, uh, required from uh, uh, enterprises. And in social media presence, uh, we can also use the procedure um, not only uh, for link, uh, for the presence of link in a website, but directly, direct, directly uh, in the social media uh, profile of enterprises. And uh, uh, other extension could be, uh, for example, to investigate more web sales, uh, uh, going to find enterprise uh, in e-market places. The marketplace is one important uh, uh, instrument uh, used by Italian enterprises uh, to make uh, uh, web sales. It is one of the few cases uh, in which uh, uh, Italy is uh, the first country in, uh, in Europe uh, for usage of the marketplace. In fact, uh, 44 enterprises with uh, 10 persons employed uh, use, uh, uh, no, making web sales, uh, use a marketplace to do uh, sales. And we can also investigate more on specific economic activities, for example, on uh, economic activities uh, uh, related with retail sale via internet, for example, in order to have information about uh, product and services uh, uh, changed. Um, and the last uh, uh, possibility is uh, to reuse, uh, to adapt the procedure described to e-government website or to website of enterprise with less than 10 persons employed. Uh, I have time, I have time. <laughs> Um, this is the name of the working team. Uh, I am just one person of uh, this uh, large working team and uh, link to experimental statistics and metadata on uh, Istat website. That's all, thank you. Thanks, Alessandra, also. You, you are perfectly on time, really. <laughs> Uh, time for questions. Do you have questions for uh, Alessandra? I, I, one thing that I would underline of your presentation is uh, uh, the fact that the important role that uh, the survey continues to have uh, in, uh, in the production of a course, and the fact that uh, this kind of uh, statistics uh, can, uh, are indeed uh, complementary to the, to the survey. And uh, you, you stressed uh, this point. Uh, I, I think uh, it was very, very clearly underlined uh, with respect to the fact uh, that uh, you, you compare to the survey and the survey is used as a training set and so on. So the, mm -hmm. the role of the survey is uh, important and is uh, still there. Uh, if no questions, we, will, uh, we can collect uh, the questions at the end of, uh, of the session. So I would give the floor to our uh, third speaker, our third speaker is uh, Peter Struss from uh, Statistics Netherlands. Uh, Peter is uh, uh, currently coordinator of uh, a big uh, European level project uh, on big data involving uh, more than uh, 20 partners. Uh, the objective of the project uh, is uh, uh, to exploit the possible use of uh, big data sources for official statistics. And uh, he will indeed present uh, the result of uh, uh, the conclusion of a first phase 
of this uh, important project. So uh, I'm sure it will be very interesting to have uh, this uh, quite complete overview of uh, what's going on at the European level uh, on uh, uh, big data uh, from uh, the European statistical system. So the pointer is there. I think uh, there are uh, problems with the presentation, so I, I come. So, okay, good. So. Let's see whether it, does it work? Okay, fine. Okay, Monica, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak at this conference. Now you've introduced myself but I don't really know you. Could you please put up your hand if you are not from Istat? Okay, that's considerable um, a number of people. Good to know for me. Um, so I'm going to talk about the use of big data for European statistics and with Europe st European statistics, I mean the statistics in the context of the ESS, the European System of Statistics, which encompasses both national statistics and statistics at the European level. Now this ESS is preparing to incorporate big data sources in the system of statistics. And for this reason, at the beginning of 2016, a large ESS net was launched. The idea of ESS net was explained by Marianne this morning. And the aim of this presentation is to give you an impression of what has been done in that SNET. Yes, it works, good. So to give you a little bit of background, it all started in a way when there was a large consensus that big data was of strategic importance, would become of strategic importance to statistics. And then the heads of the National Statistical Institutes came together in Scheveningen in the Netherlands and agreed on what would be the main issues and what to do about that. But in my opinion, one main element of that meeting was that they recognized that they should not do this alone, that they should face these challenges together, that they would have to collaborate and to enter partnerships. So why is big data actually so important? What can you do with that? There are many opportunities, and I would like to highlight the first one, that you can get much faster data towards your audience. And I would like to stress that there are new output possibilities in terms of new variables, in terms of new detail, new um, regional detail, new detail in time, in variables, etc. So now about this SNET, which is actually indeed a collaboration project with 22 partners. It has just ended this SNET, but there's a new one coming, and I will tell you about that later. But now just the results of this SNET that just ended, based on a grant provided by Eurostat, and in the grant system you also have to contribute something by the own. NSI, National Statistical Institute, so that you're really committed uh, to this. And it has a number of partners, 22 partners, and they are from 20 countries. And these 20 countries sent the representatives or collaborators uh, from their NSIs. And there was just one country that also had two ministries involved, that was France. Um, because their national statistical system itself consisted of a number of um, partners. So we have these 20 countries, 22 uh, partners, and then there is a hole in the middle, which are just put Eurostat now. They are not part a partner in the sense that they help developing these statistics uh, themselves, but they have a different role. Of course, the most important role in a sense is that they provide the money. <laughs> An other important role is that they uh, are in charge of the process of formulating the requirements of this SNET. So they, rec uh, they formulate what has, to get, uh, what, what has to be the results. And also, and the third one, and I think that's maybe in the new ECO data system 
The most important one is that they play a role of facilitating the whole project. And so, in my opinion, Eurostat in this project has proved to be a real facilitator, a real collaborator. So, what have we looked at in this SNET? We took the approach to organize a number of pilot projects organized in so-called work packages, but anyway, they are pilots. We have actually seven pilots. The first one taken together because they are both concerned with web scraping. And actually, if you look at this list, I'll go through that later, later on. When you go look at this list, there are a number that are source orient oriented. So look at a big data source and look at how the big, big data source can be used to be uh, for, uh, for statistics. And then there are a couple of uh, work packages pilots that look from the other side at the domain or at some subject and they look at what kind of sources can be used to get towards that uh, domain of output. So we have a number of pilots and they have something in common because it's all about statistics and when making statistics you normally work in, cer in a certain order and official statistics normally work on the basis of starting with data collection and then processing and then somewhere estimation and uh, dissemination. Well, the same in a way still goes for big data. But in this case for big data, the data access is something that uh, requires special attention. That is a main hurdle to, uh, to take, so we took extra attention to that part of the uh, of the problem. And at the end of the list, you, you see something like the future, and that is something we are working together in a European context. And so after all this research, uh, we have to look at what to do with these results, how to implement it, what to do at the level of the, uh, Euro uh, of the European Union. And so we put specific attention to that aspect. Now I will go through the seven pilots one by one and I will pick out some aspects that I think is interesting for this audience, um, but I will not be exhaustive. I just want you to get the general idea and I will give you reference for if you're interested in the subject further on. So the first one was about web scraping for on job vacancies. Now, as you see, you, uh, such a work package has a leader uh, coming from one country, in this case it was the UK, and there are a number of partners. And you see then that for each of these work packages, we only work with a subset of partners. And that is just to make this manageable. You cannot uh, work with 22 partners on one single subject, so you have to ask uh, countries where they are specifically knowledgeable and then they work together into in, in these work packages. And so they looked at these different uh, phases. In this case for web scraping the, uh, the main objective, the main aim was to explore the, uh, the potential for using online job vacancy data by web scraping for job vacancy statistics. And just to give you a flavor uh, looking at the, such a project, the first thing you do is to look at the data landscape and to see who are the main actors. You then know what is available, you, you know who to approach for the, uh, for the data. You see what data is structured and what data is not structured. If you do that, then you next step would be to do some modeling and to look at the data from a population point of view and then you see that there are all kinds of difficult, uh, complicated relationships between the populations that you're dealing with. In this case, for job vacancies, there was already existing um, a survey, so you could relate to that, and specific difficulties uh, related to definitions, uh, duplication, and then uh, deduplication uh, efforts. And once you've done this, then you could also, of course, look at the integration aspect to get to, uh, to estimates. 
And if you look at that, then you will see that you will have a number of matching and linkage uh, problems. Now, at the end, this project concluded that the existing survey could simply not be replaced by using online job vacancy information using web scraping. It's just having to do with the coverage of the, uh, of the population, the representativity uh, issues, definition uh, issues. But there's a huge potential, and they identify this potential, to enrich statistics with a number of supplementary indicators. And this work package then also will get a follow-up in the new uh, SNET that will come into being later this year, and I will talk about it later. Let's go to the next work package, which was led by Italy, actually by Monica. And this is um, an, um, a work package which actually was touched upon already by the previous uh, sp uh, speaker, Alessandro, uh, already mentioned a number of things that were research in, this, in the context of this uh, SNET, where, of course, also other countries were, um, were looked at. The main aim was to look at whether web scraping and text mining and similar, uh, similar techniques could be used to collect general data about enterprises that we need. For instance, say, economic activities of enterprises that are registered in registers that we need for drawing sampling samples for statistical purposes. Now, if we can use the web scraping for that, that reduces survey needs. Um, actually, the work package took a use case approach, identifying a number of issues that were specifically uh, tackled, such as this NACE code I mentioned, such as SDGs, the uh, um, in, uh, UN indicators. And um, so what they did, for example, was looking at the architecture that was need, needed for this. Now, if you work on such a project with a number of countries, you need to get onto a same kind of footing, a fundament. And architecture is then an important instrument to get that same footing. This was developed by Italy, and so they developed a logical reference architecture. And in my experience, ISTAT, one of the strengths of ISTAT is the uh, working with the, and the, the way they work with architecture in, uh, in statistics. And I think that's very helpful also at the European level to speak the same language and to be able to express yourself in the same, uh, in the same way. In this case, oh, I should go one further. Yeah. In this case, uh, four layers were identified, and for each layer there are a number of building blocks, and for each building block, tools were developed. So the, such a project goes into that, uh, into that level. As this is a European uh, uh, Union project funded, uh, as a rule, the results are available to all members of the, of the ESS. And uh, so I invite you to also look at what's all available for all these projects um, uh, on our wiki, on our website that is public for all of, um, for all of you. So another use case, yeah, now it works. Um, it's about URLs. I think this was mentioned already in previous uh, uh, presentation, but here you see again the whole process that, uh, um, that we went through, that uh, the, uh, this work package went uh, through. And so there were actually six use cases, and U URL retrieval is, uh, of course, it was one of the six. And it's very, um, very essential when you do web scraping, and of course you need to have um, a list of URLs to approach, and you need to know how good these URLs are, and you need to know how representative, how they link to the business register, etc. So this was one of the first things that were actually tackled in the whole SNET by this work package. Now I'll go to the next uh, work package on smart meters, led by Estonia, and they try to demonstrate the potential use of using smart meter data for the production of statistics. And this involved looking at whether existing statistics could be replaced, uh, the source for these statistics could be replaced by smart meter data. They looked at the possibilities for new statistics 
on households, and they looked at whether this source could be used to identify uh, uh, vacant dwellings. So that's what they uh, did. Again, they found out that the situation is quite different from one country to another. And for instance, this is the grid structure in Sweden, which is very specific. In other countries like Estonia, it's completely uh, different. But at least you need to do such an analysis because you do need to know where you get your data from. Now, once you get your data, in the case of Estonia, you get, for instance, this type of tables, these type of variables or characteristics in just a relational database in this case, and then you know what is available. And then if you do that, then of course, again, you would like to go to the aggregate level, and then you make some analysis. In this case, uh, as is depicted here, I'm not, I'm not going to all these details of these, all these uh, uh, slides. But just to give you the flavor of what uh, was investigated. And uh, what you see is then also that the data you get from smart meters, you would like to link to administrative data. And that comes back with big data time and again. If you get data at the micro level, you would very much like to link to other uh, existing uh, uh, registers. And normally, statistical institutes have, by law, have access to administrative data, and then uh, it shows that the NSI is in a special position, better than any uh, Google or whatever, to uh, produce certain type of, um, uh, of information. In this case, also machine learning was, um, was used, and in the end, uh, a number of new statistics could be identified as a possibility, uh, like uh, uh, very, very much regionalized uh, statistics, information on the use of dwellings in summer uh, compared to winter, these type of things. Now I come to the fourth work package, which is AIS data. I don't think most of you would know what is AIS. This is a system in which ships can be followed all over the globe, and the data is standardized. And um, these data can then be used for statistics, statistics on their own or linkage to uh, statistics that we have already on the use of uh, on what goes through in uh, ports, etc. Now, there's a specific source at the European level, which is called EMSA, which is an organization that collects these data for the whole of Europe. And uh, if we really can use this data, then we get harmonized data for all countries. And then for the first time, we would have a real European source uh, to be used for statistics. Now, we are negotiating with EMSA the, to use this in the, in, the, in the future. And we know already what is in there. So far, we mainly use national sources on these AIS uh, data. The aim is then to improve quality of what we already have, to improve especially comparability, with this source that should be possible, and to provide new types of data. Now, just to give you a flavor of what data you get, this is the first data we got from our national, the Dutch data on uh, AIS, and then you get this with the visualization. And then what you see on the left, that there's a certain range and suddenly it drops down. Okay, that's just a matter of where the antennas are and how far they, they reach. Uh, but then have a look at Africa. And then you see that there are many desert ships. And these are not supposed to have AIS uh, transponders. And so there's something uh, uh, funny going on there. So there was uh, some bug in the, um, in the data. They never took the, uh, the effort from the Netherlands to correct the data that come, the, uh, that come from that, that side. But then you see, as a statistician, what you uh, what you have to work with, and you really have to investigate the data that you get. If you do that for AS data, for instance, you can do an analysis of types of errors, and then you see that there are human errors and there are technical errors. You may assume that with AIS data, you only have technical errors, but human errors you also have because there's just a person entering data about the ship, 
at the, in the system in the first place, for instance. Uh, but you can go much uh, more detailed on this. I, um, what they also did in this uh, work package is look at the possible tools and they made a number of visualizations actually. I now go to the FIS work package led by Spain on mobile phone data. This was a work package where they had uh, specific difficulty with getting data access. We knew that in advance, so they spent almost all time in getting access to this data. But they also tried out to get some already some methodology. And uh, actually the process that they looked at is more or less straightforward once you've got the data. And then of course you have specific problems with methodology, with the problem that you have a certain position and you are in the reach of several antenna, etc., etc. But um, that seems all to be possible to solve. And this is an animation which is not actually in the context of the SNET, but I cannot resist on showing this because it's such a nice visualization where you see where the mobile phones are compared to where the people live. And then when it's uh, red, yeah, you see that is uh, where there's the population density and blue. And you see that people move during the day to big cities and at night they go home, apart from the center of Amsterdam. So you can derive a lot of things. Uh, there are many applications of this type of data. I will be very short about early estimates, which was output oriented, domain oriented. They also looked at non big data sources to get towards these, these data. Um, looking at early estimates, one thing was very relevant, and that was that they found out that they could make very good early estimates for GDP compared to the official uh, release. That's one of the main outcomes of this work package. The other work package that's left is for multi-domain, which was led by Poland. By the way, this is the Polish flag, but you need some imagination because the top half of the Polish flag is completely white, so it's uh, in the background. <laughs> um, they looked at especially uh, statistics on population, on tourism, on agriculture, and this is one of the population analysis that they made to model, model the, uh, the process. And they use machine learning uh, using Twitter. Have you seen everything now for, all this, for these seven work package? No, there is still an eight work package which took all things that were in common, which was about methodology, about IT, and about quality. And they looked at what could be learned about that by looking at the main aspects that seemed relevant. There's a lot of cross-cutting even uh, among these three areas, uh, of course. I invite you just to look at the lessons learned for this work package to see what all these uh, uh, pilots had in common. Now, I think I should acknowledge that I presented a lot about these work packages, but I did not do anything of that about, uh, myself. This, all this work was done by others. So I should, I think, at least mention those persons who led the work packages, the pilots. And uh, I think Italy uh, had a prominent role. And so thank you, Monica, for your contribution um, in this. So where are we going now from here? Um, were the results now really usable? Uh, do they help us forward? Now I have a look. We uh, got the opportunity to start a new SNET on big data, which will look at three things. One thing is the implementation of what we've done so far. Four of the seven are already ready to start regularly producing certain statistics. To pre uh, some countries are prepared to use what's been learned to now for the first time use this big data for regular statistics. That's very important that I think shows the success of the, uh, of the SNET that has finished. New SNET will start in November this year, will take about two years. And um, this is something that's completely new. We will also continue with new projects, new pilots, financial transactions, new remote sensing like 
satellite, uh, satellite data is new. Mobile network is a continuation, but the first stage was only getting data access. Now we're going really further. And uh, tourism statistics is actually a con continuation of the old package seven, a part that was uh, developed there. And we see potential there as well. So this is the second track. And then there's a third track, which is about trusted smart statistics, uh, linked to mainly linked to Internet of Things. I will not say much about that. Uh, because th the next presentation will about this, but this is something that has the future. Now, again, we will have a, uh, a, uh, a work package like work package eight for cross-cutting uh, issues to make especially a quality framework, um, and then uh, uh, that could then be a basis to be agreed on for the whole ESS for using big data. That would be a big step forward. The interest in the new asset is huge. We will probably get 24 partners. We have one new country, which is Slovakia. And now I come to the conclusions. So the approach so far was useful, which shows by the interest and the fact that we can go towards implementation now. For the future, we have increased in, uh, ambitions and we have the old challenges. We just go further in tackling them. But I want to mention that the ESS dimension will now become more prominent. We get, uh, and that's the basis for success, we get support and commitment of all parties concerned. Like Mariana in her speech this morning, you saw big data, the asset was specifically mentioned. This is important to have this uh, commitment. The high interest in participation was clear. I think it's also important that we all recognize the relevance of what is uh, being done. We need to adapt to the use of, uh, of, um, of users of statistics. We need to adapt to the new sources. In the public domain, we have a lot of information that is not trusted anymore. And then there's a role of st official statistics to provide professional and impartial information that can be trusted. Society is changing, and I think the role of statistics, of official statistics, is getting only more important. Um, and that is something that is, for me personally, also a motivator to work on, uh, on this subject. So we now can go to questions, if there's time for that. You can ask me now, you can ask me by email. But uh, I also invite you to have a look at the site of the SNET. It's, you just Google on ESSNET Big Data and you'll get at this uh, site. There's a huge amount of rich material available. And now I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Peter, uh, for uh, this uh, presentation. I suggest uh, going uh, straight ahead uh, uh, to the presentation by Albrecht. Uh, Albrecht Wirtmann is uh, the presentation on trusted smart statistics. Okay. So Albrecht. Albrecht uh, is uh, from Eurostat, uh, and uh, he was involved uh, in um, working in big data since the drafting of the Scheveningen Memorandum that was already uh, cited uh, several times today, and uh, is member of the task force uh, uh, big data at Eurostat. He will uh, talk about uh, this uh, new frontier of uh, trusted uh, smart statistics. Uh, so please, Albrecht. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, yeah, it's there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what I will do is we've heard about we've heard about uh, some numerous examples of. Um, researching on big data sources uh, for the use in official for the use in official statistics so um, some successful uh, some successful examples and what i would like to do is in the presentation now to challenge the statistical system so we've done the first step using third party privately held data sources big data sources 
uh, for official statistics, I would like to ask where is the society, where is the uh, technological progress going to, what, has, what kind of implications are there for our society and economy and also for statistics. So Mariana said this morning we are then following um, the life of, of the people, of the society and the economy and uh, my question is where will the society economy go and what paths could be followed then by official statistics. <clears throat> so what we see uh, in the uh, last years, we saw the, um, these big data uh, sources coming up. We saw new uh, phenomena in the economy, the platform, the gig economy. We see industry 4.0, so the digitally enabled global production chains. There are delivery services around the world, so the increasing global, uh, globalizations. We see that there are new methodologies uh, being developed to uh, treat, to analyze those data. So the key word is here, artificial intelligence. We see that um, a lot of objects are deployed that communicate with each other to form smart systems, so smart homes, smart uh, mobility, for example. And what kind of um, consequences does this have on statistics? So are there new products? Are there new means for producing statistics? Uh, so what are the implications for official statistics on that? <clears throat> we see that the capabilities of the smart technologies embedded in those smart devices have been evolving and increasing in the course of the last 50 years. They have become more and more complex and the latest generation of those smart systems combine technical intelligence and cognitive functions. So they can provide an interface between the virtual and the physical world. For example, we more and more variables are, um, um, are worn to measure physical uh, activity, to give information in principle on the health status of, of the person that are wearing these um, variables. <clears throat> The Internet of Things is a concept and a paradigm. It considers pervasive presence in the environment of a, ver a variety of objects, and they communicate wirelessly or through wired connections. They have unique addresses, and they interact with each other. They cooperate with each other to create new applications, to create new services. So. And then what does this system make smart? So in the past or up to now, we have passive objects. We have, for example, in the car, we have wheels, we have brakes, we have lamps. These objects are analog. They could also be digital, but they do not do not communicate with each, with each other. There is a person then stepping on the brake. There is a person operating the wheel. And there is a person driving somewhere. So everything is regulated by humans. With these new Internet of Things systems, we see active objects. They sense, so they measure things. They have the ability to um, um, do actions, and they communicate with, uh, with each other. They interact with a central control unit, a reasoning unit with that equipped with artificial intelligence. That provides some um, analysis and also actions based on these an analysis. They have the ability to self-regulate uh, each other so they can, um, they can react on changing conditions. And in the end, they deliver a certain service to humans. So when you have a smart home with, uh, with the heating systems, they are delivering comfort. You, in, in the past, you changed the temperature, but now with these smart systems, they react on the behavior, so they are uh, um, taking care that you feel comfortably at home. For, uh, for statistics, this means that these active objects can provide data for official statistics, and with this service, they can also provide a paradigm that they can deliver statistics as 
a service which we call then smart statistics. <clears throat> the data capture and data processing capabilities coupled with analyt analytical and statistical capabilities uh, will be embedded on the, in those smart systems. Then intelligence across the data life cycle enhanced with cognitive processes will be an essential component of smart statistics. And anticipating user needs, adapting storage, processing, improving autonomy, its algorithms may be considered as part of the intelligent process of the smart statistics. Beyond the rule-based set of instructions, algorithms might have to learn from data, adjust, take decisions in the context of statistical operations. To, in, uh, in, in principle, in the end, provide information that is valid for policy decision making. Okay. We have... Um, so we are now coming to the trust component. So in the past, we see that uh, trust is mainly generated with adhering to quality standards. So we have uh, uh, quality assurance frameworks. We have statistical codes of practice. We have a compliance with international standards. Um, we are developing um, uh, uh, standards, uh, protocols for data exchange, interoperability, uh, interoperability of data systems like SDMX, uh, DDI, for example. But in this new setting, the question is, is this enough? So um, one, um, one change in it that this data is held by third-party sources. Uh, this data is also highly, or most of the data is highly private. Um, we have a new data protection uh, regulation that introduces the principle of privacy by design. Um, we, uh, sh uh, we have to agree somehow on processing on methodologies, not only within statistical offices, but also with third parties. There might be certification, might be necessary to ensure that uh, what is then, uh, what is planned to be done is really then happening in those systems. So there might be a lot of additional aspects that are important to create those trust in uh, statistics in the end. So let's like, uh, take a look on how we create trust in statistics nowadays. In principle, everything is controlled by the statistical offices. We have a data input, uh, then we have censuses, surveys. Uh, the data is collected by the statistical offices. We have uh, uh, where the data is processed within the statistical office, and we have a certain information output. For the input data, we have to uh, assure that the data is true, is veracious, and that the provision of the data is continuous and stable. That we can make our time series. That we can uh, well look at the past how the past developed to uh, the presence. For the uh, processing itself, we, um, we have to make sure that the algorithms are doing what they should do for agreed purpose and we should agree on a certain, on a certain method. For the information output, then in principle we create trust in describing the output uh, using the quality frameworks, but also, which comes now uh, new, that it also corresponds to perceived situations of citizens. So if we then uh, continue, like in the past, um, publishing a means, for example, for the countries, that might not reflect the, the situations of smaller uh, social groups, for example. There we can use big data, we can use the new data to better reflect situations of uh, parts of the society, for example. Oops, that was too fast. Okay. And everything 
um, happens in a secure infrastructure. So we have the, uh, we give the guarantee that the data is not leaking out and that the process is compliant with legislation. Okay, this. Now the, the, to, uh, the top shows the traditional approach with the integration of administrative data from the public sector. We copied in the past the data in. We also process the data to produce a certain output. However, this approach might not be um, uh, valuable or viable anymore in the, in the current days because there is a huge amount of data there's a huge amount of data, and these data are changing very, very fast. So it would be, it could be an overkill and data overkill if we just copied all this data in to the statistical offices and then uh, process the data in a normal uh, way like we've done in the past. And also, there is also a challenge. These data are come from various. Uh, various parties, they have some uh, technical characteristics that uh, we then have to analyze and we might not have the skills in the statistical offices to be able really to uh, correctly analyze and treat those data. So there's a lot of domain knowledge also necessary. And a third aspect is that copying this data in creates a huge base of probably sensual data, sensi sensitive data, that, um, um, that is a target for an attack, for a security attack. So you uh, increase the risk by just uh, um, centralizing the data for those attacks. A way out could be that we push out the computation partially, so we're creating e intermediate products and then we use these products and for further processing to produce our statistical, our statistical output. In principle, there are new computational models are necessary for doing that. And in the end, we call these then trusted smart statistics. <clears throat> so how can we achieve this? In principle, what is new that we have third parties involved. So we split up then the phase of processing those data in a design phase and an execution phase. In a design phase, which is uh, uh, shown on top, we agree with the data holder. Um, so we, the, uh, the statistical office with the data holder, probably with the involvement of the data protection authorities on a certain algorithm, on a certain method that processes these data. We design a process that is certified, for example, by the data protection agency, and we decide what output then is delivered uh, based on which input data. For the execution phase, uh, we have to make sure that the algorithms are really run in the, um, uh, by the data holders and uh, we foresee that the access to the input data is only done by the data holders so they have an exclusive control on the input data themselves. However, we have a shared control so between data holders, national statistical offices, on the processing and the processing then will be hybrid so will be then distributed among different uh, different agencies uh, different actors that could be statistical office could be the data holders could be somebody else and the way this data is treated depends a bit on the sensitivity of the data so for example if uh, sensitive data is involved we foresee that we um, uh, have a technical approach which is called secure multi-party computation that ensures the privacy of the data but ensures also a certain output. <clears throat> so this shows then this uh, secure multi-party computation. The error shows that once you prepare these, uh, the data to put into the computation, the data is not more, no more data. It's, we call it secret shares. And the arrows indicate that you cannot go back. So you 
from the secret shares, you cannot go back to the original data. However, you can go forward, you, the processing is distributed and by combining the outputs, you get the original, so the result of the original outputs. So as a conclusion, if the privately held data cannot be shared due to privacy or business sensitivity, this uh, secure multi-party computation could be a way out because we do not have access or do well, we do not share the input data, but we are using the input data to produce a certain result. We speak not of sharing data, but of using data. I'm now coming to the end then. So we had seen the smart part of it. We had seen the trusted uh, part of it. So trusted smart statistics conceptually includes capabilities of smart systems. The trusted smart statistics can be seen as a technology embedded in smart systems that transform data and produce a certain information that is presented in the form of statistics. But we can also see it as a service provided by smart systems that ensures the validity and accuracy of the output and respects the subject privacy and protects the confidentiality of those data. And with this, I like to, uh, would like to thank you for your attention. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Albrecht, for, uh, for this presentation that uh, I think there was much curiosity about uh, this topic because it's uh, quite discussed at the European level, but uh, I mean, it's a new topic anyway for, uh, for most of us. Uh, let's uh, not take the questions right now because we are running a bit late so i uh, would uh, ask the next speaker that is marcello savarese to start his presentation marcello savarese is a, a chief data officer in uh, uh, wintre and uh, uh, is in charge of the whole data supply chain in uh, wind from the data management processes uh, to big data and analytics, uh, including AI, machine learning, and cognitive approaches, up to the transformation of insight uh, to actions. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, Marcello, for joining us, uh, if also because I know that you are not very well today. So thanks uh, for that. Uh, the floor is yours, so Marcello. Okay. Okay, first of all, let me uh, apologize because I'm a little bit uh, very, uh, I'm a little bit cold, as you see them from my voice. And uh, so please forgive me if I will uh, talk here and I will go through the presentation in Italian just to be in my comfort zone, let me say. Okay. Um, uh, avevo preparato un discorso, ma mi piaceva iniziare da un altro tipo di conversazione che ho catturato durante la discussione e durante la presentazione dei, di questi lavori fatti dal Presidente dell'Istat, no, da Leva. Uh, I due punti, i due pillar su cui noi siamo fortemente convinti e vogliamo investire sono sicuramente quelli che nel payoff vengono descritti come decisione consapevole insieme. Questi due punti ovviamente declinati in un'azienda hanno una vista fortemente diversa rispetto alle descrizioni che hanno fatto prima eh, i colleghi. Noi ovviamente eh, il nostro obiettivo è quello di legare e di tradurre tutta la nostra capacità di trasformazione con gli analytics dei dati che abbiamo a disposizione in revenue o ridurre i costi che dobbiamo affrontare per l'ongoing delle nostre attività. Quindi i nostri obiettivi sono molto più legate alla nostra capacità poi di generare valore, eh, dove il nostro revenue significa riuscire a generare valore per il cliente. Però questo passa attraverso sicuramente una situazione in cui c'è un'enorme complessità ed ambiguità dovuta al, um, al mercato, agli operatori, ai fenomeni che in questo momento possono interagire e interferire con eh, i nostri clienti e allo stesso tempo sentiamo fortemente l'esigenza di 
aprire i nostri contenuti formativi anche per creare del valore supplementare generato dalla possibilità di lavorare in una logica open data e allo stesso tempo di open technology. Quindi i nostri obiettivi sono di un'apertura sia dal punto di vista della metodologia, e questo è uno dei motivi per cui siamo qua, ma anche dal punto di vista tecnologico ed è quello che facciamo collaborando con alcuni progetti a livello europeo. Durante la presentazione quindi io andrò uh, diciamo un po' a sottolineare questi aspetti che sono legati a questi due pillar, in particolare i temi di lavorare assieme sia dal punto di vista metodologico che in questo momento forse è il tema che più interessa a voi ma anche per il tema della, della tecnologia. Um, lasciate dire due parole su Win3, uh, sapete che veniamo fuori da una fusione di due aziende piuttosto grosse, Win3, abbiamo circa 30 milioni di clienti, questo però sta a indicare più il fatto che noi scarichiamo e carichiamo nei nostri database, nei nostri repository più di 5 petabyte di dati al giorno, quindi effettivamente diciamo, abbiamo dovuto industrializzarci per, per in qualche modo riuscire a catturare tutte le possibili insight e valore che potevamo dare ai nostri contenuti informativi. Questo l'abbiamo fatto investendo nella nostra infrastruttura digitale perché questi 5 petabyte di dati non li facciamo soltanto sulla rete, ma anche nei punti di contatto con il cliente. Quindi ogni volta che andate sull'app, ogni volta che avete un contatto con il nostro sito web, ogni volta che siete in negozio dai nostri uh, dealer, noi intercettiamo dei contenuti informativi che vengono poi uh, integrati all'interno dei nostri repository con tutti quelli che si chiamano mobile phone data, che sono i dati che vengono da invece dal network, quindi dal, dalla rete. Uh, ovviamente tutto questo lo facciamo in una logica fortemente allineata con uh, uh, le regulation e le normative che sono presenti. Su alcuni temi, ad esempio, non possiamo entrare, non possiamo in nessun modo gestire, anche per chi ci ha autorizzato al trattamento, alla profilazione, e a essere campagnato, diciamo, e quindi con contenuti pubblicitari da parte nostra, ehm, conoscere eh, il contenuto informativo che vi scambiate con i gigabyte che utilizzate mediante la nostra rete. Quindi quei contenuti, nonostante le autorizzazioni, non potremo mai conoscerli. Comunque... Diciamo, quelli non sono tutta la parte del contenuto informativo che ci permette di fare analisi più o meno sofisticate. Ovviamente il nostro obiettivo, come è scritto qua, è diventare no, il primo uh, operatore fixed mobile, quindi con la convergenza sia del fixed mobile, ma per operare una logica di next generation, che come è stato descritto prima dai colleghi, per noi sono i 5G, no? quindi una rete davvero veloce, e tutti i, i contenuti formativi che mediante le logiche di IoT possiamo scambiare con i nostri clienti. Pensate che adesso stiamo facendo delle eh, sperimentazioni più mh, abbastanza sofisticate, sia dal punto di vista tecnologico che metodologico, che arriva, uh, il cui contenuto informativo arriva fino all'utilizzo dei frigoriferi in, in casa. Quindi tutto ciò, per esempio, che viene gestito anche in una logica di Google Home, se avete visto i vari uh, diciamo, strumenti presenti sul mercato, per, che supportano la gestione diciamo, del quotidiano per i nostri clienti, sono contenuti informativi che noi utilizziamo in forma, in forma nomina, in anonima. Quindi in questo senso ci siamo ingaggiati anche noi sulle logiche Big Data. La nostra struttura, come detto prima, parte dai eh, contenuti formativi che abbiamo a disposizione mediante una logica, una definizione di una strategia di dove andare a posizionare poi questi contenuti informativi e soprattutto poi dove andare a mettere l'intelligenza. No, prima parlavo dei frigoriferi, quella sperimentazione prevede delle strumentazioni che sono on board allo strumento stesso e quindi gli algoritmi che noi gestiamo, lanciamo, vengono integrati direttamente nei firmware del, degli strumenti. Altri ovviamente sono gestiti in maniera locale quando sono più relativi ai vari touch point che descrivevo prima di relazione con i clienti. Comunque governiamo l'intero ciclo di vita del dato, da quando viene raccolto, quindi collezionato, 
a quando viene opportunamente trasformato con le logiche di machine learning, diciamo che il nostro stack metodologico di big data prevede anche analisi di tipo cognitive e analisi di tipo intelligenza artificiale. Pensate ad esempio alle comunicazioni con i call center, diciamo che stanno evolvendo, in questo momento stiamo utilizzando degli strumenti di intelligenza artificiale per comunicare al cliente e stesso la macchina, tra virgolette adesso che parla con il cliente, è molto spesso... Diciamo, per il 97% delle volte i clienti non si accorgono di parlare con una macchina, almeno quelli che sono al momento sotto uh, fase di test. Uh, non sto a raccontarvi aneddoti che poi diventano anche piuttosto divertenti, perché poi il dialetto e, e le informazioni o affermazioni piuttosto colorite spingono la macchina ad agire in maniera uh, diversa, quindi alle volte la macchina prova anche ad andare oltre ai contenuti informativi che non abbiamo inserito perché comunque impara da sola, però ovviamente diventa divertente una discussione che non è fatta alla pari quando si scende molto nel colorito. Ecco. L'aspetto interessante comunque è che tutto questo ci aiuta a governare e a creare quello che noi chiamiamo data driven company. Quello che vogliamo fare è realizzare un'azienda che prende ogni decisione sui fatti, sui dati, non ovviamente eh, trascurando l'esperienza dei business expert, quindi inserendo con delle logiche di dual, dei business dual, all'interno dei modelli, dei algoritmi che noi presentiamo, realizziamo. Il secondo punto che volevo toccare, è, è nella logica dell'integration, dicevamo prima, è, sono le collaborazioni che stiamo avendo diciamo, con il mondo esterno. In questo momento collaboriamo con l'università, con l'Istat, con la pubblica amministrazione e qui eh, mi mostro alcuni casi, ad esempio con Istat abbiamo cominciato a collaborare nel 2014, abbiamo dato disponibilità dei nostri contenuti, i CDR del, dei calling data record, quindi dei tempi di chiamata, il traffico, i flussi, quando avviene la chiamata, logiche di geolocalizzazione, quindi il passaggio per cella di una particolare chiamata e con questo ovviamente siamo partiti, forse siamo stati prima a partire con questa logica in Italia, eh, a validare il contenuto informativo che avevamo a disposizione, in particolare per quanto riguarda eh, logiche di sorgenti complementari, quindi univamo questi contenuti informativi ad altri che potranno essere le revenue per area, per zona, per um, cominciare a gestire anche internamente delle logiche di pricing, fino alla possibilità di definire le matrici di origine e destinazione no? e quindi capire i flussi di spostamento delle persone per gestire ad esempio quello che si chiama il tourism analysis o l'event detection. Ovviamente noi come azienda con questi contenuti informativi facciamo anche altro no? e in una logica open data come dicevo prima collaboriamo anche con banche per fare valutazione di credit risk model. Ovviamente anche noi abbiamo, siamo anche un po' una finanziaria diciamo perché quando vendiamo un cellulare, un mobile phone, insieme con le nostre schede, abbiamo anche logiche di rateizzazione no, del pagamento. Questo insieme a altri tipi di logiche, che sono le forme di pagamento, che poi vengono gestite come carte di credito, bollettini postali o RIB bancario, vengono messi insieme ai contenuti formativi della banca e tiriamo fuori delle analisi di, di credit risk. Pensate anche a tutti i contenuti informativi in ambito geologistico per quanto riguarda i, i grandi distributori di, di prodotto, no? sto parlando di DHL, quindi diciamo grandi provider di servizi di tipo logistico che supportiamo con questo tipo di logiche. Abbiamo partecipato, partecipiamo a progetti europei nell'ambito dell'Edge 2020, abbiamo, stiamo sviluppando due... Uh, due progetti, due collaborazioni, uno per quanto riguarda il solution for requirement engineering è basato sulle logiche di rete partendo però dal contenuto informativo che riusciamo a scaricare dai social network per integrare poi le competenze dei nostri esperti con quei contenuti informativi per fare delle prime analisi sulle logiche di, di networking. Stiamo lavorando anche in una logica di open technology, come dicevo prima c'è tutto l'aspetto legato al cloud based appliance che stiamo creando con la comunità europea, stiamo realizzando dei contenuti formativi che vengono, saranno poi trasmessi su un data lake operazionale così 
come tutte le logiche di streamlining dei flussi informativi per generare poi delle logiche di analytics sopra. Questo con l'obiettivo finale di trovare no, delle del, del strumentazioni, delle realizzazioni che ci possono portare a quello che è la Availability Performance Resource Allocation. Stiamo collaborando, stiamo collaborando anche con uh, l'agenda digitale italiana, con uh, il team di Diego Piacentini. Uh, con loro, il DAF, il Data Analytics Framework, uh, abbiamo combinato uh, nostre informazioni con contenuti formativi che venivano dalla, uh, dal DAF arricchendo il nostro contenuto informativo e creando dei use case sempre più sofisticati. Con loro partecipiamo anche alle logiche di data hacking del, del, di italiano del 2018, questo anche per produrre diciamo, sempre più competenze che in questo momento sono piuttosto scarse, al di là degli istituti di ricerca, delle strutture piuttosto grosse come le vostre, diciamo, è ancora difficile sul mercato riuscire a trovare determinate competenze che il vero problema non è soltanto avere la disponibilità dei dati a una tecnologia efficace che permette di fare l'analisi più o meno opportuna, ma quella di creare un modello operativo che in qualche modo possa creare quello che io chiamo la data supply chain, quindi gestione completa di tutto il contenuto informativo, competenze per trasformarlo e quindi i famosi data scientist e una vista che in azienda c'è e che diciamo, non è stata sottolineata in maniera importante è il fatto che poi noi dobbiamo trasformare quegli insight in azioni che ci consentono poi di creare il vero valore per il cliente e quindi maggiori revenue, maggiori revenue per noi. Questa vista diciamo, noi la inseriamo tutto nella sola figura del data scientist ma poi in realtà è abbastanza scomposta in, uh, in diverse risorse che partono dal data engineer per i contenuti informativi allo statistico, all'analytics model per chi deve trasformare questi dati mediante le logiche dello stack metodologico che dicevo prima fino a esperti di business che sanno come realizzare una campagna e che cosa offrire al cliente. L'ultimo punto che volevo toccare è relativo a quello che noi stiamo realizzando in azienda in termini di use case. No? Prima abbiamo visto alcune proposte di ciò che si sta realizzando in Uh, con, uh, con l'impegno di Aerostat noi diciamo che uh, come data driven company quello che vogliamo fare è indagare ogni pain points dell'organizzazione e tradurlo in una logica di analytics noi non pretendiamo ed è un esercizio che purtroppo in molte aziende capita che la persona di business venga da noi con una richiesta specifica di analytics Uh, io ho bisogno che tu mi modellizzi in una certa maniera il mio cliente o mi crei un algoritmo di clustering per la mia customer base. Non è questo che chiediamo. Noi quello che facciamo è prendere il contenuto informativo che abbiamo a disposizione, discutere col business, capire il loro mal di pancia. Io non so come proporre l'offerta migliore, questo è il loro mal di pancia. Posta a noi nella struttura del Chief Data Officer tradurre con contenuti e competenze di analytics eh, questa esperienza, diciamo, questo pain points del business in qualcosa che tiene conto anche degli aspetti analytics. Quindi diciamo che tutta l'organizzazione Win3 è toccata da eh, questo tipo di logica, quindi noi lavoriamo sia con le persone diciamo, più commerciali, quelli che devono effettuare le campagne, oppure quelli che devono sono in relazione con le vendite o quelli che sono in relazione con marketing ma anche con le persone del technology quindi l'ottimizzazione dei processi di rete il fault first management quindi capire dove spostare le risorse in base a analisi predittive su dove si rompono le parti all'interno del nostro network fa parte del nostro background e dell'attività che svolgiamo la logica è abbastanza semplice, no? quindi quella di partire dagli obiettivi strategici di business che possono essere per noi indicatori fondamentali di governo dell'azienda, quindi la misura di churn, la misura di inattività, la misura di cross-selling e di upselling, metterli insieme con algoritmi di data science e eh, insieme alle logiche di tecnologia per creare e mettere a terra gli use case. 
Non ho potuto portarvi degli use case per motivi di disclosure, ovviamente non possiamo, uh, non possiamo tirar fuori insomma, i contenuti formativi che in questo momento, per, in particolare per quest'area, vengono ritenuti altamente strategici. Ve ne racconto qualcuno abbastanza divertente, oltre a quello del logico di intelligenza artificiale che vedevamo prima, no? i classici modelli di CERN che mettono insieme i contenuti di CRM e tutti i temi di relazione che dicevo prima di touchpoint con il cliente con mobile phone data. Oltre ovviamente a questo livello, no? il mobile phone data le associamo a logiche di qualità della rete, però questo livello è toccato anche da eh, contenuti che noi peschiamo su Twitter. Ad esempio noi utilizziamo Twitter per predire le logiche CERN settimanali, quindi noi mettiamo in relazione Twitter, le logiche informative di rete, la qualità della rete e le logiche di cerno del cliente. E stiamo ottenendo insomma, dei risultati abbastanza interessanti. In questo momento il PSC lo trasformeremo a breve e passerà in produzione. Un altro elemento che forse può farci dire è quello del lens exchange. Uh, sapete che noi uh, vendiamo praticamente anche uh, mobile phone o no? handset e Um, il contenuto informativo che peschiamo dalla rete insieme al tipo di informazioni che vediamo sui social uh, e sulla rete nel senso di network sono dei contenuti informativi che ci aiutano a capire quando un cliente vuole cambiare il proprio cellulare quando è pronto a cambiarlo e anche addirittura che tipo di cellulare prenderà ovviamente partendo da mobile phone data noi sappiamo che Marcello ha un Samsung J5. Chi ha un Samsung J5 e ha fatto esperienze di qualità della rete particolari non comprerà mai un Apple. Quindi non offriamo mai un Apple a chi ha quel tipo di cellulare. Sto facendo esempi, non è il vero cellulare che discrimina in questo momento. Giusto per fare un esempio. Però noi partiamo da quella conoscenza per tradurre e capire qual è il cellulare. Su questo arriviamo a una accuratezza dell'88%, quindi diciamo che sbagliamo veramente poco a capire che tipo di cellulare vuole comprare la persona. Un'esperienza un divertente su questo contenuto informativo è che ho scoperto che poi è il movimento delle persone che determina anche il tipo di cellulare che acquisteranno. Persone che fanno lunga percorrenza, hanno lunga percorrenza o utilizzano i treni per, per muoversi e quindi logiche di geocalizzazione vanno verso una tipologia di cellulare ben preciso. Persone invece che sono più diciamo, legate a una localizzazione, quindi all'interno di un territorio anche abbastanza piccolo, tendono a un cambiamento che invece è di un periodo molto più lungo. Ovviamente dal punto di vista diciamo, fisico non riusciamo a spiegare il perché di questa relazione. Ci siamo lanciati nelle più interessanti analisi vision per quanto riguarda queste esperienze. L'unica idea che al momento ci è venuta è il fatto che l'utilizzo del cellulare in movimento implica una logica di wifi utilizzato molto più, in maniera molto più pesante. Vi ricordo che noi non possiamo sapere che cosa sta guardando la persona, però e ovviamente il consumo lo conosciamo del, del, um, dei dati e quindi lo usage dei dati relazionato con wifi potrebbe presupporre l'esigenza di caratteristiche performanti totalmente diverse anche perché il cellulare che viene acquistato dalle persone che si muovono di più è di, di alta gamma non sono legate stranamente a logica di revenue cosa che invece uh, avevamo presupposto nel senso che finisco, è l'ultima slide eh, non sono legate a logica di revenue, il che è molto strano. Diciamo che eh, ogni cliente eh, acquista qualsiasi tipologia di cellulare e neanche le logiche di viaggio, quindi le logiche di eh, transizione da un comune all'altro, una provincia all'altra, su una lunghezza più o meno prestabilita, non dipendono minimamente dal revenue. Quindi non impattano sulle logiche di pricing. Stiamo studiando con Trenitalia i motivi per cui accade questo, però al momento non abbiamo ancora una risposta. Uno degli elementi che ci spinge poi ad andare avanti sulle logiche di Big Data Analytics è proprio quello, no? riuscire a scoprire e investigare su situazioni che per il momento noi non riusciamo a spiegare. Alcune cose che erano dei miti in azienda 
li abbiamo disilluse. Alcune altre invece che non si conoscevano stiamo andando avanti e stiamo cercando di capire il perché. Io ho finito. Thanks a lot, Marcello. Ci sono domande. So, five minutes uh, question time. Um, who would like to start? Yes, sure. Uh, you can come here. And, oh, that's a microphone. Yeah. Okay, I have a question for Peter. <laughs> uh, I am a ISTAT researcher, so I, I'm working on road accidents. And uh, recently I have been co-author of a paper on the connection from mobile use and road accidents. So we used uh, some data from an Italian private company, uh, a sample, and uh, we um, use the, the road accidents in the same area in the same period. So we had a positive connection. So <laughs> I wanted to ask you if on uh, this uh, working package five uh, on mobile use data, you study this aspect too, the connection with road accidents, for example, uh, because the destruction now is really a, a, a very uh, <laughs> Uh, interesting item to study distraction for drivers uh, when they drive uh, and they cause the road accidents. So it's very uh, actual like uh, the, uh, the item. Uh, maybe I can speak with my colleagues too because they, I know that they do something. But uh, I do this. I did this with another institute uh, with the, the job uh, with labor and prevention institute. So we we studied something. Uh, uh, out of Istat, but uh, I know that <laughs> my colleague they do a lot. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, please, Peter. Yes. Is this better? Okay. So no, in the uh, SNET we have not looked at this specific problem. And as far as I know, we are so far not considering uh, looking at this in the future. But now you mention this, I will just mention it to the person who is uh, describing what uh, will be done in the next uh, work package on mobile phone, uh, so that he can consider this. Be I think this was just pro probably not being considered. Having said that, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, I can talk of our own experience. We have looked at combining mobile phone data with other data that's a little bit connected, that is road sensors. And so you can see that there's, of course, a high correlation of where uh, what's the, the number of cars that pass road sensors. We have about 60,000 road sensors in the small country of the Netherlands. Yeah, we make statistics on them, on the road use. There's a high correlation with where mobile phones are. And then once in a while we have a difficulty that uh, used, uh, especially when the uh, specialists look at the outcomes of this big data source, that they think, well, is this plausible or not? And then it happens that suddenly the road flow stops because of one reason or another, that there's uh, people working on the, on the road or there's an accident. And uh, yes, uh, and so that is, uh, uh, in that sense, that is uh, that's looked, uh, looked at. But uh, so there's even more things that you could combine to get an answer to the question in, in which you are interested. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Peter. Any other question for our speakers? Okay, yeah, please. Thank you. I am Cristina Martelli. I'm teaching University of Florence in Statistical Information Systems. I would like to ask you if there is any idea in, a, in the European perspective of using the typical technologies and methodologies like 
learning machines and so forth, not at the end of the biography of the data, but at the beginning, at the starting point, I mean, in terms of uh, official ontologies, for instance, in order to improve the integration of the data starting from the very beginning. Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, either Peter or uh, Albrecht, would you like to answer? Um, yeah, okay. So um, I think there are examples for, for, for doing that, especially when I'm referring to um, um, using machine learning techniques, for example, for text analysis, when you do, uh, for example, for the scanner data, you have to map um, product descriptions to um, uh, product classifications. There, um, uh, machine learning approaches are used. And there are several other uh, examples then uh, in where especially text analysis is used for uh, mapping uh, descriptions onto, uh, onto topo uh, topo topologies. Um, so far, I'm not aware of using um, machine learning for bridging one classification to another uh, classification. Um, so far, my, my experience is that, uh, well, in, in the context of uh, that is mainly used in the context of text analysis. Probably don't know whether you have to add something. Now working? Yes, yes. yes? Okay, fine. Um, okay, so uh, I find this an interesting question because there are many data sources that can potentially be used by more than one user. And then the question arises, should every data user do its own um, data um, cleaning, uh, possibly with um, machine learning or not? And uh, quite often, uh, some data become open data, and then the question is, uh, would it be beneficial to all if these open data have been cleaned already or have gone through some pre-processing? And one instance that I know of is uh, with satellite data. So some of the satellite open data are actually pre-processed already before they get open data. And there are organizations behind these uh, satellite data that uh, actually take a number of decisions that have consequences for what we can use as statistics. And uh, I think statisticians should get involved into these type of decision making. And this is precisely also the th thing that I think Albrecht um, uh, was looking at with smart statistics you want to get very close to the systems themselves so that they already have some output that can be uh, used for uh, statistics. So try to get as uh, in the uh, process of uh, the data generation as early as possible. And in my opinion, that should involve already um, uh, machine uh, learning uh, techniques. In those cases where it's really obvious uh, what kind of output you would like to get from the uh, from the data, some kind of recognition of faces or whatever, these kind of things. Thank you. Thank you. If I may quickly add also uh, with respect to the um, uh, reference to the ontology, uh, there are some efforts for structuring the metadata layer for accessing, for instance, uh, mobile phone data. So that's another thing, but we can, uh, we can also cite this. Let me say is, uh, uh, what we exactly are doing, because we are using uh, machine learning methods in order to understand the quality of our data. What Peter said is perfectly aligned with that, because uh, we insert some data from different uh, repositories. Uh, many of them are not uh, in charge of us. So in order to test the quality that in the past was uh, uh, with the very long layer, with the many business rules in order to identify the quality of data, now is something that we are managing with the machine learning. 
So we are very keen to work on that uh, about uh, the collection of the information uh, regarding topics of quality, also for the ontology, because in this way we are creating the data model quickly from the data warehouse that you are managing without any, uh, let's say, information on that and information on the catalog, uh, and information about uh, where are the data, or what's the lineage of the information. So we're going uh, perfectly in that direction. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think we have a time for another question. I think it's time to conclude, but uh, I mean, now there's uh, a lunch break, so you have uh, the time uh, to speak uh, uh, with, uh, with the speakers, if you have uh, some specific things to ask. Let me, thanks. Uh, thank you a lot to all the speakers of today because it was indeed a very interesting uh, session. I think that we can have uh, an applause for them. They were great. <laughs> and uh, one short communication. The next uh, uh, appointment is at 2.30 here with a panel with uh, uh, Giorgio Alleva. Diego Piacentini, Emanuele Baldacci, and Valerio Fiorespino. And we'll be here at 2.30 and not at uh, uh, three something as written in part of the program. So it's 2.30 here. Thank you very much.